Welcome everyone to the special installment of EMS Focus, a collaborative federal webinar series. I'm John Kramer, Director of the Office of EMS with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Together with our federal partners, NHTSA's Office of EMS is focused on advancing a national vision for EMS. The projects we undertake and the resulting resources for the community help with systems improvements, measuring the health of EMS systems nationwide, and delivering the data that EMS leaders need to advance their individual systems. Another role of the office is to educate the EMS community on new innovations, processes, and technologies that can, in the end, help provide better and more efficient patient care. This free webinar series hosted by NHTSA's Office of EMS is a unique opportunity for federal EMS agencies and industry experts to share information with the EMS community. EMS Focus conducts webinars several times throughout the year on issues that are important to the EMS community and provides you with timely information on what federal agencies are doing about them. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be archived on ems.gov for future viewing and listening. There will be a time at the end of the webinar for questions, but please feel free to type questions or comments using the chat feature throughout the webinar. More information on the EMS Focus webinar series can be found on ems.gov. Since the standup of the National Response Coordination Center under FEMA, I've also been the team lead for the FEMA Healthcare Resiliency Task Force, EMS Pre-Hospital Team. This team is composed of representatives of many federal agencies and a number of stakeholder organizations with a large number of very committed, talented, enthusiastic individuals. That team has focused extensively on the needs of the EMS community during this coronavirus event. One of those very important issues relates to testing of the nation for infection. And obviously that's a critical issue to EMS clinicians. There is a lot of information out in the media about testing issues. Today, we'll discuss testing issues that specifically relate to our EMS staff. The areas of discussion today include background information on the current science of testing, when to test EMS clinicians and other first responders and how to operationalize the results and the role of EMS in expanding the community's testing capabilities. As I mentioned, at the end of the webinar, we'll take questions. So please go ahead and submit them throughout the through the chat feature throughout the webinar. We are extremely pleased to have our guest speakers with us today sharing their expertise and experience. Dr. Michelle Owen is Associate Director for Laboratory Science at the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's National Center for HIV AIDS, Viral Hepatitis, STD, and TB Prevention. She is also currently serving as co-lead for the COVID-19 Laboratory Task Force in the CDC's incident management structure. Dr. Jonathan Jew is the EMS Medical Director for Mahometh County, Oregon, including the City of Portland, and is the 911 County uh, Medical Director. He also is a member of Oregon 2 Disaster Medical Assistance Team and a Professor of Emergency Medicine at Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Jew is board certified in emergency medicine, internal medicine, EMS, and infectious disease. Dr. Michael Sayer is medical director for the Seattle Fire Department and the Seattle Medic One program, and is an emergency physician at Harborview Medical Center. He is also a professor of emergency medicine at the University of Washington, where he serves as the medical director for the Michael K. Kopas paramedic training program and leads the EMS fellowship program. It is now my pleasure to again introduce and turn the presentation over to Dr. Michelle Owen at the CDC. Good afternoon. I hope everyone can hear me okay. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak at this important webinar. 
So my goal today is to talk a little bit about the different types of tests that are available for SARS-CoV-2 testing and a little bit about the current recommendations for testing. So the first slide on viral tests. So the, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about different types of tests. So viral tests are obviously tests that test for the virus itself. Now there are many commercially available diagnostic tests on the market. Most are nucleic acid tests. There are a mix of lab analyzed tests in both point of care type formats, such as lateral flow. CDC had one of the first tests that was available out there. It's basically a nucleic acid test that was developed at CDC. And it allows the use of multiple specimen types from the nasal cavity, whether it be nasopharyngeal swabs, oral pharyngeal swabs, and now, for example, just nasal swabs and things such as nasal washes, et cetera. Um, the other thing, most of the other commercial tests also have very similar sample types that can be used for this type of testing. There is a desire to move to actual self-collected swabs just because it allows for the save, uh, the um, saving of PPE, sorry. The one thing I want to highlight, no matter what type of testing you're doing, is that proper specimen collection is key to getting an accurate result. Without good specimens, you're never going to have a good um, diagnostic result. There, and because of that, there's actually guidance on the CDC website about proper collection of samples. And the website is actually there if you're interested in seeing that. The other thing that I would like to highlight is that as of May 8th, we have our first antigen test that's available. And this test is also a rapid test format. And instead of testing for the nucleic acid of the virus, it's actually testing for the proteins of the virus. The data that is available for this test suggests that it's a very high specificity for the actual test, but it has a lower sensitivity compared to the nucleic acid test. So there's a greater chance of false negatives. If you actually look at the information for this test that's available on the FDA website, you will see that there's about an 80% um, predictive, positive predictive um, agreement with the antigen test compared to the nucleic acid test. And this is likely just because you don't have the amplification effect that you have with nucleic acid testing. So my next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about serology. Um, unlike the nucleic acid test, serology tests have just recently been being reviewed by FDA. Um, there are now 12 serologic tests that have emergency use authorization by FDA. The thing to remember about serology tests is they indicate prior infection. Um, they can detect various types of antibodies. Um, they can be designed to only look at pan antibodies, so any type of antibody basically that a person makes to the virus. They can be specific for IgG, IgM, or IgA, or combinations. In general, with most infections, IgM is the first antibody that develops after someone's infected and then followed either by IgG or IgA, depending on the type of infection. The interesting thing that I really want to highlight is we currently do not know if having antibodies means that a person is truly perfected, um, protected from future infection. There is some data to suggest that there is at least a short-term um, effect that may be protective because we can actually look at neutralizing antibodies in vitro and show that the virus is prevented from being replicated. However, the data are still limited and we're still trying to collect more. So there are definitely multiple studies going on about immunity and the duration of the antibody response. Currently, CDC and the other uh, White House Task Force is not recommending that you use antibody testing for diagnosing active infection because we do know that for the people we have followed longitudinally, antibodies tend to develop about 7 to 14 days after a symptom onset for people that are symptomatic. However, as I mentioned, it's useful for determining population prevalence, and it's also valuable in investigating transmission dynamics to inform prevention strategies. So my next slide, 
I just want to talk about general testing considerations again. Once again, the sensitivity and specificity are characteristics of the test itself. So can you, the test have an analytical sensitivity to detect an antibody and is it specific? Um, but I want to talk a little bit about predictive value of a test because the predictive value of a test is related to the prevalence of the disease in the population. So positive predictive value is the probability that subjects with a positive test truly have or had the disease, whereas in contrast, negative predictive value is the probability that subjects with a negative screening test do not or have not had the disease. And this is really important in the context of the antibody testing that I was just discussing. So I want to give a couple of examples about that because there's a lot of information that people want to know about antibody testing, and I want people to understand how important it is to have a very specific test. So the next slide, please, talks about um, predictive value examples. So the point we're making here is if you just assume a group of individuals have a prevalence of about 20%, and this is kind of estimated what might be happening, and first responders and or healthcare workers. Um, if you look at this, you can actually, if you do the calculations, and I don't expect anyone to sit here and do the calculations with me, but I wanted to just provide an example. So for example, if you tested a million people and you have a test that's 95% sensitive and 95% specific, you're gonna have a certain proportion of people that are true positives and a certain proportion that are false positives. So then if you actually look at the positive predictive value in this situation, you will see that if the test does have those characteristics and there's 20% of the population, the actual positive predictive value of the test turns out to be about 82%, um, but the negative predictive value is very good. So this isn't a population that has a fairly high prevalence, but on the next slide, you will see what might happen if you test in a much lower prevalent population. So this is the 5% um, prevalence as opposed to 20%. And this is what people might be thinking is actually happening in the um, general population. So if you look in this case, and let's just say that we tested 2 million people, that you will see that the positive predictive value greatly decreases compared to the 20%. So it's only about 50% is the negative predictive value is still very good. So this is important in the context of testing if um, you're doing antibody testing in a large population. So the next slide. Um, I want to highlight the fact that the SARS-CoV testing is still evolving um, to change. And oops, there's a typo there. I see it says one instead of two. Additional specimens are being evaluated for testing because we know that things such as OP swabs, for example, use a lot of PPE because the person that is doing the collection for the test has to be protected. So there is a desire to switch to less invasive sampling types to save PPE as long as we get good results with those sample types. So nasal swabs has already been shown to be effective. Um, however, the next sample type that people would like to use is saliva. So there's several um, demonstration projects that are going on to look at paired nasal swabs or NT swabs and OP swabs compared to saliva because this would obviously be a much easier sample type to collect. Same thing, there is uh, an EUA that allows nasal swabs at home to be collected, to be collected at home and then uh, sent in to a commercial provider to actually do the testing. There's also additional nucleic acid extraction and amplification technology that is being explored, particularly for the nucleic acid extraction. This is important because this has actually been one of the rate limiting steps for some of the testing. While tests might be available, there has been wide shortages of the actual extraction reagents, and that's cause some of the delays in testing. So there's additional work to look at the diff different um, materials to do the extraction. The other thing that's in the process of happening is there's multiplex platforms that are being developed because we know like when the, in the fall when flu becomes 
circulating again at a high level. We might have co-infections between influenza and SARS-CoV-2. So we know that it would be very beneficial to have these multiplex platforms that allows for testing. And as I mentioned, serology testing is increasing and being refined. There are multiple commercial laboratories that now have um, serologic testing available. And now there are high throughput assays to do serologic testing. And to improve the overall results, there is the potential to do a two-test algorithm that would actually further improve that positive predictive value that I just talked about previously. So the next slide, please. So just want to highlight the current testing priorities and all this information can be found on the CDC website. These testing priority recommendations were developed by the White House Corona Task Force along with the NRCC, HHS, and CDC. The last updated version was April 27th and it was to highlight the current state of the pandemic. So for high priority testing, it is hospitalized patients with symptoms, healthcare facility workers with symptoms, workers in congregate living, living settings with symptoms, first responders with symptoms, residents in long-term care facilities, as well as other congregate living, living settings where there might be symptoms. So for example, prisons is an example of this. So the next slide. Um, these are the other priority, but Wharton considers the highest priority. So it's any persons with symptoms and as you know, the symptom category has expanded to fever, cough, shortness of breath, chills, muscle pain, um, new loss of smell, vomiting or diarrhea or sore throat. So basically anyone with those particular symptoms. And then individuals who are prioritized by health departments or clinicians. Um, this can be done for sentinel surveillance, for example, in long-term care facilities, et cetera, hospitals, and any other screening of other asymptomatic individuals that the current state or local would like to do. And so once again, you can actually find this information at the CDC website. And I believe that is my last slide. Other than the contact information. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Owen. Uh, there's a lot been going on in testing for this disease over the last several months, and um, I'm sure it's been fun looking at the evolution and challenging to help sort out all of that information. We will uh, obviously come back to a number of those issues in a few minutes uh, as we get to questions and answers. And please remember for the audience, if you do have questions, go ahead and submit them through the chat feature and we'll get to them later in the webinar. I'd like to now turn to Dr. Ju to talk a little bit more about the, the testing modalities and how we think about operationalizing them in the EMS environment. John? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, next slide, please. Be before I actually uh, start, I have uh, nothing to declare and because I'll be mentioning uh, names and pro uh, labels, uh, I have, uh, uh, the opinions are my own as well as uh, not my agencies. Next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> so these are the, the sources of some of my slides and I will be moving through them fairly quickly, but if you wanna go back in the slides and find out where they came from, uh, that's why I put them in. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, in summary, I like to get to the uh, chase. Uh, the best current way of determining screening providers for SARS-CoV as far as the, uh, the providers being infectious or having uh, COVID-19 is the viral PCR screening for viral RNA. So I noticed I deliberately said viral RNA uh, and I wanted to clarify that. Next slide, please. Uh, so currently, the gold standard uh, as far as testing for the presence of virus itself is the PCR test for the viral RNA. The good news about viral RNA, it is rarely positive. So if you have a positive test, you have a very good, very, very good idea that you do indeed have COVID-19. 
the problem that we have, and everybody has noticed this before, is the ability to detect the presence of the virus varies from where you are in your disease process, as well as the viral sampling, uh, as well as the uh, nuances of the disease. So again, this is saying that our ability to detect on one sample is only 70 to 80% on one sample. Next slide. So there is a significant variation to uh, the consternation of EMS providers on the viral detection of SARS-CoV-2. So I'd like to explore why that is. Next slide. So this is the source of some of my um, uh, data here. This is for information for, for when you wanna go back uh, to see the reference. Next slide. So if you actually look at the molecular detection of SARS-CoV, and this is a cohort of 15 patients, Highlighted in red is the virus actually found in the uh, <clears throat> blood or the serum of the patient. The highlighted in purple is the uh, virus found in the um, oral <clears throat> uh, uh, swabs of the patient. Highlighted in yellow is the virus found in the anal swabs of the patient. Notice when you have highlighted in blow red and green, Sometimes the oral swabs do not show up here as well, okay? So that is the nuances of the virus, uh, a sampling for the virus. Also highlighted that the, in this study, the worse you are at, uh, the less you're likely to actually find a virus in the oral sample. Next slide. So uh, the nuances of the uh, antigen of the test uh, in, indicates the following, that when you're testing for the nucleic acid, the RNA, it is very, very specific and uh, uh, quite sensitive. But when you're actually testing uh, for the nuclear capsid, which is the antigen, uh, sometimes the virus, uh, the sampling is not as uh, <clears throat> sensitive, but the, there is a, it's a much more rapid, quick test. Next slide. So this is a busy slide. But the bottom line is the following. When you actually look at the slide, this is from the Infectious Disease Society of America. If you have highly suspected individuals that repeated sampling is, uh, is recommended. If you have a low suspicion for a person who's symptomatic, then you, they are suggesting you do not um, request sampling of the, uh, of the patient here as well. Next slide, please. So let's talk, take a look at actually what happens to the virus when you look at hospitalized patients. Next slide, please. So if you actually see this slide, you'll actually notice the following. This actually shows you the samples uh, from various samples. In red is the serum, the virus and serum. In uh, dark brown is the uh, virus and sputum. And the gray area is the virus and stool. And, uh, and the, uh, blue is the virus in urine, and light yellow is the virus in oral swabs. You'll notice that uh, number one, that the virus in the serum lasts for less than two weeks. If you also notice the viruses in the stool will last for three to four weeks, and the viruses in the sputum, as well as the swab, will actually last only three to four weeks in most cases. Next slide, please. So this is a very important slide, and it really highlights the following that number one, just because you can detect a virus does not mean that the virus is infective. So this actually on the highlighted in red is the culture. And after uh, approximately one week after the onset of symptoms, we are not able to culture any virus from um, any of the samples here as well. So detection of the virus after a certain period of time, while the virus may be detected, it may not be infectious. Next slide, Pierre. Uh, so the other issue is that the virus will continue in the uh, anal swabs uh, when the oral swabs are negative. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the antibodies fairly quickly here. Next slide, please. So the issue here is, can I use antibody tests to see who's immune and then go back to work? The bottom line is the following. We do know that uh, people will have uh, antibodies when exposed to the virus. Most recent antibodies are the IgM and um, 
uh, the long-term antibodies are the IgG. Uh, we do not know which of these antibodies are related to immunity. So I wanna highlight two things. Number one, the antibody tests are usually very good if you actually have exposure to the virus. But well, right now, we do not know exactly which antibody is actually protective. Next slide, please. So this is a pretty busy slide, but I like to highlight the following. In, the, in, in blue is the nasopharyngeal swab as far as the onset of virus. This is a little bit um, misleading because most of us think that you are infectious one to two days before the onset of symptoms here as well. Highlighted uh, in the dotted line uh, in purple and green are the antibodies. So what I wanna emphasize here in this slide is the following. The detection of virus early on is usually always uh, done by the PCR test looking for RNA. Exposure to the virus happens anywhere from as early as one week to as late as four weeks with fairly reliable at three, two to three weeks um, down, in the, uh, down in the process of the uh, disease here. So if you expect to use the antibody early on, you're gonna be uh, not able to detect the virus um, with the antibody test. You'll only be able to detect it with the antigen test. Next slide. So let's talk about neutralizing antibodies. Next slide. So if you actually look at the um, uh, cogeners highlighted in the left-hand side is the coronavirus itself, but highlighted in the right-hand side is a 3D model of the actual spike protein. Next slide, please. So this is a busy slide, but when you actually look at it, what I'm trying to illustrate is the following. We don't know exactly what is the protective antibody uh, <clears throat> for to actually prevent the virus from uh, actually infecting us. If you actually look on the left-hand slide, uh, the RDB on the S1 area is actually what was thought to be protective um, at this period of time uh, for the antibody uh, uh, to be protective here as well. So what we're really trying to say is that we are getting fairly close to uh, identifying the protective antibody. But the problem we actually have right now is that we need to be very specific as everybody knows, there are about seven coronaviruses known to infect humans and we need to identify the actual uh, portion of the protection of the antibody. So just to reinforce what I'm trying to say, right now, the uh, portion of the antibody that's thought to be protective is the portion that actually is on the spike protein. And that portion of the subportion of the S1, which is the RDB component, prevents the virus from actually attaching to the uh, human cell. That is the portion of the virus uh, that we are really targeting the antibody to to identify uh, the protective uh, antibody uh, that indicates immunity. Next slide. So the duration, I have only two or three more slides left. Next slide. And this is, uh, from the Korean uh, uh, study, Emerging Infectious Disease. Next slide. So on the left-hand side, you'll actually notice two things. Number one, highlighted in red is the one, uh, the patients that had severe disease. Um, on the top portion is the neutralizing uh, antibody and the bottom portion is the ELISA detection of the antibody. They actually correlate. So it has two things. Number one, if you watch it really closely, the duration of this antibody in severe patient is high if you actually have severe disease. But if you have a very mild disease, it actually falls off to as little as, detect, uh, as one year down the line, you might not be able to detect antibodies here as well. So we do not know the duration of protective antibodies. Next slide. So in summary, next slide. The role of detection of antibodies is the following. As uh, Dr. Owens really said, the utility for serology is for detection of PCR negative cases. This is a clinician of patients who are exhibiting COVID-19 and all our assays are negative. Secondly, there is identification of convalescent plasma donors. Uh, if we actually identify the protective antibodies, we can, uh, we can use these antibodies to actually develop plasma donors or even a monoclonal antibody. Uh, th therapy. Finally, epidemiological studies and verification of vaccine um, is an uh, important aspect here as well. But again, this is very early. 
and it's really a mistake to uh, jump on the bandwagon early on because there's very falsely, there's a high degree of false negative tests as well as false positive risks. In other words, if you are falsely positive, you may walk around thinking that you are protective to the coronavirus. If you're falsely negative, then uh, that basically will tell you the wrong information here as well. Next slide. All right, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate the, the context of uh, making those comparisons. We'll now turn to Dr. Michael Sayer from uh, Seattle, Washington and King County EMS to look a little bit more about our EMS implications and how we can potentially be more involved. Michael. Thanks, John. Uh, you hear me all right, John? Yes. Perfect, so next slide, please. Uh, I just thought I would quickly go over a little bit about what's happening in Seattle to help those uh, elsewhere uh, who are listening. Um, as most of you probably are aware, we had our first death uh, reported in the United States in King County, about 10 miles from where I'm sitting, on February 28th. And our EMS system uh, quickly ramped up in terms of taking care of patients with uh, a syndrome of COVID-like illness. So these are people who Obviously, in EMS, you don't get to diagnose the patient definitively, typically, although some patients represented later with diagnoses. In the beginning, they didn't. Um, that ramped up and peaked for us at the end of March and the beginning of April, and now we're on this long, slow decline where we're now seeing about five people a day in the city of Seattle uh, who have some sort of syndrome of COVID-like illness or influenza-like illness. So that's substantially better than when it peaked and it was closer to 15 a day. So we're uh, uh, much better off than we were a few weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> next slide. One of the things that uh, we did very early on was recommend uh, this uh, an ensemble of personal protective equipment that was consistent with the Centers for Disease Control recommendations. And uh, so this basically represented wearing an N95 mask for us when encountering patients who we had some reason to think maybe had COVID disease, uh, eye protection, uh, goggles, an impervious gown, and gloves. And um, note that we are not wearing uh, Tyvek suits uh, and not wearing a lot of other gear. This is essentially the ensemble that our teams have gone in and taken care of patients with. Next slide. At the very beginning of the illness uh, uh, presentation in our community, however, we hadn't really implemented this fully. Uh, we were following the recommendations from the CDC. Um, and this slide shows sort of our experience with occupational exposure and personal protective equipment use from middle of February through the end of March. And as more information came in, uh, we slowly expanded the definition of a patient that we would uh, think to be concerned about. Um, so the dark blue represent encounters in which EMS uh, providers were exposed, and the height of the bar represents the number of people who were exposed. So in other words, these are EMS providers who were taking care of patients with subsequently proven COVID-19 disease. Um, who are not wearing the sort of full personal protective equipment that I just showed you. And then the light blue represent EMS providers who were wearing this full ensemble of PPE. Now, you'll note that even before February 28, we did have encounters where they were wearing uh, the full PPE because this is something our system has used for a long time uh, when patients had influenza or other kinds of respiratory illness. Um, so there were encounters that had that. The line on this chart shows the fraction of uh, <clears throat> the proportion of EMS providers who had what we would consider adequate PPE while they would take care of COVID-like patients. And what you note is as we expanded our definition of PPE advised calls, so these were cases in which the dispatch system identified a potential COVID patient and gave recommendations to the crews to make sure they were wearing PPE. 
as well as importantly, in the middle of March, implementing a scout program where we had two out of a four person crew on an engine company wear full PPE and the other two hung back. So they didn't have any real risk of exposure unless the patient proved to be sick, in which case all four members would don full PPE. Our exposures have declined dramatically. And uh, now we have many fewer people exposed to um, cases who were not wearing full PPE. In summary, this represented 700 different EMS providers who cared for uh, several hundred patients with proven COVID disease, and exactly three people tested positive using the nucleic acid test or PCR test out of this 700. And in all three of those, it was not really clear what the true source of exposure was, um, but we'll presume that they were exposed through their job. So three out of 700. So the message is this PPE ensemble works and it works well to prevent uh, EMS workers from getting infected with COVID disease from uh, taking care of patients. Next slide. One of the things that we had to do early on as this uh, pandemic began to affect our community was figure out how we were gonna test first responders. And the University of Washington began doing virology testing on March 2nd and had a reasonable capacity. The problem was we didn't have any way to get people swabbed. So uh, we got a variance from the state of Washington to uh, allow paramedics and EMTs to perform nasal swabs and developed a procedure for this, used guidance from CDC and others to help teach them how to do the nasal swabs and came up with a plan uh, to have a drive-in testing clinic, uh, which for the beginning was hosted by the Seattle Police Department at uh, one of their warehouses. So it was indoors in early March when it was raining a lot, and that was useful. Um, it's now outside with tents, uh, but, and this program has expanded. Um, we figured out strategies to make sure we minimize the use of PPE, and that's part of why the person doing the nasal swabs is wearing a different kind of PPE ensemble. That's because that person doesn't have to change PPE between each patient. Uh, they're essentially doing the swabs and changing their gloves unless they got soiled because they're not touching the patient in any way, shape, or form. Um, so we really worked hard to minimize PPE consumption at this first responder clinic. Next slide. So what does this accomplish? So this is data through yesterday, uh, and we've expanded to three sites and tested 658 first responders. And overall, the positivity rate is 43 out of the 658. But interestingly, again, as we've done a better job with uh, social distancing at the bases, at the fire stations and EMS bases, um, and improving our, our uh, crew's use of full PPE. Uh, the fraction of, of uh, workers that get tested who are proving to be positive is now down to about 2% over the last 14 days. So um, this is, uh, again, good news for the community and good news for our first responders. Um, so having this availability of this first responder testing site has been quite useful to us. Um, and as you can see in the lower right panel, the number of people who are presenting for testing has declined, uh, which I think reflects a couple of things. So one is there's just less COVID illness out there right now. And number two, there's less other viruses, so less other disease that people might think could be COVID. And so as this declined, we began to expand the people that we would accept in these testing sites. And as we learned uh, how to make this work better, so now we're testing a broader group of people. So next slide. Um, and this includes not just first responders, which would be firefighters, EMS workers, police officers, um, folks that work at the jail um, and others to include other essential workers that are publicly employed. So the uh, bus drivers, the um, essential workers who are working for the public utilities, uh, like the sewage and the electricity and the water, 
Uh, we need electricity, we need water, so they are also important and we're willing to test them at our first responder drive-through site. Um, and we've expanded the definition to include family members of first responders since that has proven to be the primary way first responders are getting infected in our community. Uh, they're not getting infected from patients, they're getting infected from their coworkers and from their families. So we wanna keep the workforce healthy. And one way to do that is to increase the access of testing to the families of first responders. So we're now doing that as well. And then finally, uh, last week, we have begun implementing contact tracing and testing contacts. So uh, next slide. Um, this means that if someone is a contact, whoa, 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 go back one. Um, a contact of a worker who is positive. So if a EMT or a paramedic uh, gets uh, tested and is positive, um, then we will go back 48 hours and uh, from when that test was done or the person became symptomatic and identify all of their close contacts that are in our workforce or other first responder workforces or their close household contacts and offer all of those people nasal swabs, even if they are asymptomatic. And the purpose of this is to try to identify the source, the person who maybe has minimal symptoms, who was the individual who um, potentially infected the first responder worker who is now testing positive. And we're hoping that this more aggressive approach to testing will allow us to quarantine people earlier and isolate them as well if they are positive. So uh, we've got a return to work algorithm that deals with this that we um, adjusted when CDC published updated return to work guidance. And our strategy is a symptom-based strategy. We do not repeat PCR tests. If someone has one PCR test that's positive, that's great, they're positive. And we don't do any more PCR tests because we learned early on they stay positive for a very long time, weeks, many weeks. Um, and using that as a guide to return to work is just very difficult. So it's much better to wait until their symptoms have improved, um, they're feeling well, they're not having a fever for 72 hours without any kind of antipyretic medications, and their symptoms of cough and other respiratory illness type symptoms are largely resolved and they therefore are safe to return to work. And CDC recently as well updated the guidance on this to shorten that interval a bit uh, as long as the person is feeling better. Next slide. So um, this allows this one cohort of novel to us at least is what do we do with this person then who is reportedly asymptomatic and test positive. So we have one person in that category now um, who got a nasal swab and was asymptomatic at the time of the swab and it was positive um, and he never got symptoms. He's the only one we've had this like this out of the uh, 40, um, uh, what is this, 43 people who have tested positive, only one of them has been asymptomatic. Uh, so he essentially spent uh, his time in isolation and all of his contacts also were in quarantine and everybody's now back to work from that. Next slide. So as this workforce that we've trained up to do testing at our first responder sites became less busy, we pivoted to begin to test in the community. And as everyone knows, nursing homes have proven to be a major uh, source of deaths from COVID-19 disease. So we now have a three person team of EMS workers that goes into nursing homes. This takes a lot of organization ahead of time. Um, and we have a couple of people that are quite good at this now um, and will help organize the nursing home a couple of days in advance. Ideally, we get a point prevalence survey done where we go through and test everybody at that nursing home and try to find, help that nursing home figure out what fraction of the workers and the staff, uh, I'm sorry, the residents and the staff members actually have PCR tests that are positive. Uh, the nursing homes have generally been quite open to having this help. 
Uh, and now pretty much all of the nursing homes in Seattle have had some testing either because of EMS doing this or some of the local hospitals helping out or the public health uh, group helping out. Um, and we're now pivoting to uh, smaller facilities and continuing to do this surveillance uh, as a way to help the community identify cases early and isolate uh, and do contact tracing. So with that, uh, next slide. I want to uh, thank John uh, Kramer and everybody else for the opportunity to uh, talk to you. Um, I really appreciate the EMS uh, people who have stepped up and thought about all the different ways that they might make a difference in this epidemic, this unprecedented situation that we find ourselves in. Um, and uh, their willingness to go and take care of these patients, especially in the beginning when very little was known about how dangerous it would be. Uh, they, it's a really impressive group of people that I get to work with and I wanna thank them. And I'll turn it back to John Kramer. Thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate the uh, perspective, the descriptions of your system and the comments regarding the folks that you work with. I think we all feel uh, very similar to that uh, when we look at the uh, field clinicians that we have an opportunity to work with on a day-to-day -day basis. I wanna follow up real quickly, Michael. Um, we got a question for clarification having to do with linking patients who test positive to your crew members and be able, being able to do the appropriate um, and subsequent contact tracings. How do you yeah. handle that in your system? Yeah, so we're really lucky here because EMS in King County is embedded within the health department. Uh, and uh, so when this epidemic first happened, Dr. Tom Ray and I uh, were spending much of our days at uh, King County Public Health and basically on the same floor with the surveillance team that's trying to figure out who's infected. So there is this very close working relationship, which I appreciate is not really true in many other places. And essentially the workflow that we built, uh, and I didn't do this, uh, people that work there, the MPH folks and others who are part of the King County Public Health Infrastructure and King County EMS, uh, developed a workflow that matches each day's new positive tests. Uh, so we get a list from the state of Washington every day of all of the people who tested positive that they just discovered in the last 24 hours. And we match that list of names with the EMS uh, electronic health records. So just basically do a name match. And that works pretty well. Uh, you run the risk, of course, that maybe somebody didn't spell the name right or they didn't know a name. So there could be some misses in here, but uh, this works quite well for us. And then we identify a group of uh, everyday uh, people. Um, so I just got this email while we were on this webinar for today and how many potential cases there were. Um, then one of the physicians, either one of the EMS fellows or Dr. Ray uh, reads the EMS record and uh, sort of determines whether or not they think an exposure might've happened. And that's based on the PPE documentation and the like. And if there is a concern for an exposure, then a different team swings into action to do the contact tracing uh, and to isolate uh, that individual and, and make sure that everybody's staying safe. Thank you. Um, Dr. Owen, uh, I'm gonna turn to your uh, expertise with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. One of the uh, comments that we have heard from a number of folks is that um, their agencies are not able to get information back from the uh, either state or local public health department who's ever doing the testing when there is an EMS patient who has been transported and subsequently test positive. Uh, the health department is just unwilling to share that information. Is there anything we can do to help improve that engagement or information sharing capabilities? So that's an interesting question. So it's really up to every state and their state epidemiologist as far as 
whether they are willing to share the information. So I guess you know or may not know, in general, CDC doesn't actually get the names of individuals. It stays with the state. The only results are submitted to CDC. So it's really a state issue and trying to work with a state epidemiologist. Great, thank you. Uh, another question for clarification that has come in. Does a positive PCR always indicate active infection and that there is shedding of infectious viral material? Uh, uh, either Dr. Owen or Dr. Ju. John? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I would have to say no. Uh, at this period of time, there's pretty good evidence that, as I said in one of my slides, you can be PCR positive but not be infective as well. And I think Dr. Sayer sort of alluded to that in the way he was handling the exposure. So the answer is no. Yeah, and, and this is Michelle. I, I will actually add, CDC has some data that's not published yet. It's the same where we have followed people over time. And just like the paper that's published, after about eight, day eight or nine, after symptom onset, we cannot culture. And it's also interestingly coincides with about the time antibodies are uh, detectable. So, yeah, absolutely agree. And I think this next question will uh, be a follow-up to that and supports a little bit of what Dr. Sayer was saying toward the end of his presentation. Uh, using the testing process for return to work, there's an agency that's identified uh, at least two providers that continue to test positive via nasal swabs on multiple tests and are now uh, up to 30 days out post initial test. What are your criteria to determine return to work? So uh, Michael, Sarah will take a shot at that, John, to, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, we early on really struggled with this because we had a couple of people who, uh, one person in particular who tested positive, who had been at the life care center uh, nursing home. And um, and so, you know, his 14 days were up and it was like, now what? And there wasn't any real official guidance for us. And we had several conversations, with different infectious disease people about this. And we decided to retest him and then one other person subsequently. And they both stayed positive for well past day 21. And as John Jew already alluded to, uh, this was uh, just, they were feeling fine. They were itching to get back to work. Mm -hmm. uh, this didn't make a lot of sense to us. And so we began this symptom-based strategy as opposed to a retesting-based strategy to allow people to return to work. And CDC now has this as part of its official guidance on their website. And um, I, I don't have the URL in front of me, but it's pretty easy to find. Yeah, John, this is John yeah, Ju. Okay, go ahead, Michelle. No, I was just going to say, yeah, the, the guidance is on there. CDC has gone to the symptom-based approach. The other thing I will say that CDC has actually um, put out there that we are continuing to um, look at this, and we have been accepting samples from states where this is the case to try to definitively show that culture can't be done in a lot of these cases. So just for information, if you really want testing done and culture, we might be able to do it for a limited number of individuals. Yeah, uh, John Kramer, this is John Ju. I would John. have to agree with Michelle. Yep. What we don't have is the uh, viral culture uh, following the PCR test, but I would have to agree with Mike Sayer that clinically, if they're looking well and they meet the criteria for going back to work, it is reasonable to send them back to work at this period of time. Thank you. Another, we've got a couple of minutes yet. I've got a couple of questions we'll still go through. Uh, caller has a 120 man fire department functioning as an EMS first responder agency. They have had no employees with a positive COVID test to date, but are wondering about the advisability of testing all members now, especially using the antibodies as a, as a baseline. Does the panel have a consensus recommendation? 
uh, I'll take that as a first shot right now. Um, the problem that we actually have is uh, we have an incendiary of antibody tests. We do, it uh, depends upon what you're looking for. If you're looking for individual protection, in other words, uh, you have antibodies, you can go back to work uh, because you're protected. That would probably be a mistake and I would not advise it. If you're looking at uh, to uh, identify a group of people, if they're higher risk, low risk, or no risk, or no such thing as no risk, then it would be reasonable for background. But the problem is you need to uh, know what you're testing for, know which antibody are you testing for uh, the uh, uh, exposure to the virus or are you testing for immunity to the virus as well? So the answer is no, I would not do this at this time, but maybe in the near future. I would be very interested in what Michelle would think. So I would agree with you, because like you said, we really, it's good for looking at potentially what the prevalence might be in that particular group, but as far as protection, I would say no. And it really is, I totally agree. We don't know which antibodies are protected. And since there are so many different tests, some actually test for antibodies to that spike protein that's been described. Others actually test for the nucleocapsid, which is inside the virus, which probably isn't protective. So I think until we truly have identified the protective correlates, it wouldn't be advised to do it, particularly for are, are they safe question. Thank you. And a final question for probably John and Michael. Um, how have your field providers, your EMS clinicians and firefighters, responded to this testing issue? I'll let Michael take the first shot. <laughs> sure. Uh, I think um, we are getting a lot of people that would like to know if they should get an antibody test. And as uh, was just stated, it's really not clear what do you do with that information. So I think certainly the testing is available now, a good antibody testing, I should say, a serology test uh, that's run on an ELISA platform, not a finger stick test, uh, is pretty darn reliable. And that testing is becoming available, I would imagine, in many communities. Uh, so people may want to know, and that's fine. Um, I'm not clear what we should do with this, and my preference is to try to help our workforce uh, use their um, uh, interest in this problem to try to learn something, especially to inform some of these questions around immunity uh, and moving forward, uh, who might be a good candidates for vaccination studies. Uh, so we're partnering with the University of Washington uh, virology team and uh, doing have a, a voluntary research project going on where some of the first responders go and get their nose swabbed and their blood drawn and then they go back at days 30 and 60 and 90. And I think that's helped people. They, they uh, helps their uh, uh, anxiety about this a bit as well as allows them to make a contribution to gathering new knowledge. Yeah, I could just add to that right now. It depends upon again, the purpose of uh, what you're trying to achieve. If you are in a uh, area of high prevalence of infection, like New York City uh, or New Orleans or Detroit or one of those cities where you're actually looking for, uh, I would say, uh, workers who have been exposed, uh, then most likely that would be very helpful, um, assuming that you have higher or low risk. But I think until we actually have an idea which antibodies that you're looking for and if they're protective or not, I would hold off until a couple months until we have further delineation. Thank you all very much. That's pretty much the time that we have for today. I would remind folks to please be aware that um, this webinar is being archived, will be available to either listen to again or to share with your coworkers on EMS.gov. Uh, there's also a lot of information that has been produced by the uh, FEMA Healthcare Resiliency Task Force, EMS and pre-hospital team with the goal of helping folks in the community. Again, thank you, Dr. Owen, Dr. Ju, and Dr. Sayer. And thank you to everyone else for joining us. We know it's a really busy time for all of you. 
And as was mentioned earlier, appreciate everything that you're doing for your communities across the country. Reminder that we're getting ready to celebrate and recognize National EMS Week next week with a number of outreach programs and uh, various uh, recognitions, uh, taking social distancing in uh, as part of that. So while we won't be able to do a lot of the usual activities, please make sure that you still take a minute and reflect on our profession and the contributions that you all make to your communities every day, whether there's a pandemic there or not, and recognize the individuals within your own organizations. Thank you all so much for what you do. Stay safe out there. Enjoy the rest of the day, and we will talk with you again in the future. Thank you, everyone.